Joining us now, of course, she was a national champion pitcher, part of Oklahoma's national title team back in 2013. Of course, has been the assistant coach at Northwestern, leading their pitching staff. I speak of the great Michelle Gascore, was also a great player professionally, and is back on the show. Good to see you again. Uh, we haven't been a while, but uh, I know you've been occupied becoming a mom. Uh, how's that been going? Yeah, thanks, Eric. Thanks. It's it's good to be back on. Um, yeah, it, it goes fast, and it's the last three months have been a little crazy, but um, really thankful to have been home with her this whole time, and now we're gearing up for season, and, you know, she'll be right side of us side us so um we're excited she's she's really fun i know it's early but is there any tosses any lefty tosses being warmed up in there we're, we're ambidextrous we're, we'll see we'll see we're, we're starting to things so we're her and uh our her dad and, and i are really paying attention to that That's a little funny. too much probably a little bit yeah yeah it's gonna be scrutinized a little bit i have a feeling uh but you know She'll, they'll figure it out over, over time. You've got some time to figure it out. So you've been, obviously you're now getting set for the start of the 2022 season, but I kind of want to go back to last season. With 30 and 17, you made the NCAA tournament, but it was such a unique year because you only played conference-only games in the Big Ten every week. Uh, you started the season in Leesburg, uh, in Florida, which ironically you're going to start again in 22 to play non-conference, but Describe what was it like just to play conference series in 2021? Uh, what was that like? It was it was definitely interesting. I'm happy to move forward and not do it again. Um, but I think it, it, we, we learned a lot. We learned our pitching staff learned a lot. In the beginning, when we were down in Leesburg, we played double headers and then we played three game series, which is what we're accustomed to. And then getting back into Big Ten territory, going into the four game series was tough. It was definitely um, different. We did a, a single game Friday, Saturday doubleheader. Most weekends, weather sometimes changed the changed the order of things, and then a Sunday single. And those Saturdays were tough. Our pitchers really had to learn how to get people out a lot. You know, we're using we're facing the same lineup four times. Um, some games were going to be battles that were going to be high scoring and whoever, you know, whoever comes up out on top offensively and others were zero, zero shutout. So, um, you know, it, it, we learned a lot. And I think that into the three game series, when we get into big 10 again, in this season will be better for it. Um, but everyone else will too. So it'll be, it'll be interesting, but I'm excited to see what we've learned from it. This, this upcoming season. I talked to Nebraska head coach Rhonda Ravel, and she said one of the neg the things that she it showed is that systems like the RPI is flawed, and that you know hopefully we could show you know find another system to help figure out teams because she fed they felt like they were playing in the dark. You didn't know where you stood because everybody else is playing a lot of the major conferences are playing non conference schedules of some sort. You're not. It reflects on the numbers, but meanwhile, it's not like. They, they didn't think you'd get a fair description of the league. Uh, what is that kind of the talk among the coaches in the league there that, you know, you hope that, you know, there's a better way to maybe evaluate teams because it was hard. I think the committee had a hard time evaluating big 10 teams. You guys got a four seed <laughs> to go to Lexington. I mean, that was kind of like, whoa. Yeah. I, you know, we didn't know how, how the committee was going to go. We're, you know, our, the coaches in our conference, the head coaches did a really good job communicating, um, as much as they could with the committees and every everyone that was part of those committees kind of under, trying to get them to understand what we were doing and that maybe we shouldn't be going off just RPI in, in 2021. And um, we were disappointed because the precedent seemed to have been set with volleyball and women's basketball that they didn't really look at it. Um, well, I guess women's basketball has a system, but with, a, with volleyball, we, you know, the Big Ten is such a strong conference. So they were able to not really use the RPI for that. And we thought that they would follow suit with softball and it didn't seem like they did, which was disappointing because I think that we were really strong last year on each other four times. So everyone was familiar with each other and um, us only getting three teams in was disappointing, um, especially, it, you know, it is what it is though. You, you know, you do your best. And um, I do think it opened the conversation for the future of how we're seeding teams and how we're getting them in. Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, I had Coach Gillespie from Iowa, and they finished fourth, and they yeah. felt like they was out of they, there was nothing they could do. Like, you know, it, it seemed like in talking to coaches, the the one positive was there was an urgency of 
hey, we got to win every Big Ten series we can. We got to finish this high. That's probably our best shot. Did you feel that way? Like, you finished third in the Big Ten, and you were the clear third best team. That maybe probably got you in. Obviously, you know, maybe perhaps the past, you know, past success, but finishing third in the Big Ten had to probably be a factor because that was the only way you could kind of figure out if you had a shot or not probably where you stood. Yeah, we had to, you know, we the only thing we could do was win the games we had. You, you know, there was nothing else that we could control. So that was our ultimate goal. And we had a we had a tough stretch of games against the teams. We, you know, we had, I think, Iowa, Minnesota, and Michigan all in a row with Illinois mixed in. And so, you know, all really, really good programs, all, you know, I thought deserving of making the tournament on a normal year. Um, so we had those with those four game series that was tough, but like, like, like I said, we could only control what we had and the games that we had. And, and luckily it was enough to get us in. I do not want to be a four seed again. though. <laughs> no. And boy, based on your non-conference schedule uh, in 22, you definitely won't have that problem. Uh, coach, coach Drohan, we've had her on before that you all are never shy to play a, a, a non-conference schedule. No different this upcoming year, you're going to start uh, ironically again back in Leesburg, but you're playing UConn, which is a proof program there. Virginia Tech was a super regional team, Liberty NCAA tournament team, uh, highlighting that tournament. You're going to be playing at the Clearwater Invitational, at the tournament with ESPA. You got Texas Tech, UCLA, Clemson, and Oklahoma State. And then you're also going to go to Mary Nutter. You're arguably playing in the two most premier tournaments in the sport back-to-back weeks uh with marquee opponents that is uh wow that deserves a wow on the schedule there yeah thanks you know we're excited that's what we do but you know that's why our players come to northwestern to go to those tournaments and to and to compete at the highest level so i'm excited to get back out there with that schedule and and to face non-conference opponents like we are we're really we're really itching to get out there and i think those those that clear water turnaround to palm springs will be tough and it'll be a good test so when we get into big 10 we'll be totally prepared how much is that influenced by what you have back you've got a veteran group coming back of course we'll talk about danielle williams leading the circle but you've got a pretty good nucleus back that's been around the block if you will how much does that influence when you schedule the way you do yeah, I, I guess I didn't realize, but when our schedule came out, um, they wrote up that we had eight out of 10 starters returning and 10 spot being our defensive third baseman that graduated. But um, yeah, I'm excited. They are veterans. I, I think um, really cool, just tidbit with me being on maternity leave through the fall, you know, our battery of Daniel and Jordan Rudd, Jordan Rudd being a senior who's caught almost all the innings since she's been a freshman on campus, you know, she's calling all the games all fall, you know, and she could do it, you know, throughout the spring, if she wanted to, her and I are on the same page always. So I think that leadership on the field, you've got, you know, seniors up the middle at shortstop and in center field. So um, I'm really excited to see them because I think they all had a really good freshman year. And then, you know, Danielle and I have talked about her, you know, it's, it's hard at coming off a hard, a good freshman year and uh, sophomore slump, they call it, but you know, it can be a little tough as a pitcher when people really know you and learn, learn, and you have to battle back. So um, I think she's kind of had two sophomore years with having a just preseason and then a just big 10. So excited to come out of that and really just feel like an upperclassman this year. Yeah. She won 17 games, had a two year, right? First team all conference. What, have you, how have you seen her grow from the day, the first day she walked in? Uh, you mentioned that incredible freshman year, memorable year, you, you know, tough 2020. Like everybody had a tough short in 2020. Then last year now, what, what have you seen the, the growth from her as she enters here in 2022? Yeah, I think her maturity and how she goes about goes about communicating and her game planning. I think that she really understands what she does well and what hitters are trying to do against her. Um, in order to counter. So I, I'm excited to see she's been working very hard this fall to um, imp- just improve all of her pitches because she knows that people know what she's going to throw now. So she wants to be able to beat them even if they know what's coming, which I think um, I'm excited to see her work towards. You mentioned, obviously, you were not around as much in the fall, uh, but you had a, you, talk about how that went as far as with the pitching staff. How much communication did you have with them? How would that how did that process go uh, in the fall with you not being as, around? Yeah, so I was really fortunate um, that Morgan Newport, who just graduated, who is a utility player for us, pitcher, hitter, outfielder, 
she's our graduate assistant. So she's able to kind of be around the bullpen with the pitchers as familiar, understood the workouts that I wanted them to and was a great leader while she was on the team and still is. So they, they really trust her. And then um, even better, we were able to have Eileen Canny, who is, you know, one of the most decorated, if not the most in uh, pitcher in our program, who lives locally and coaches locally. And she was able to help us out as an alum um, and come by the pitchers, which was really great, especially for our freshman pitcher, Lauren Curry out of Ohio, just getting her on campus um, and, and Lini being able to really work with her uh, was was huge. So I was really thankful for that. So it, it really felt like I I missed them, obviously. And I and I came by when I could. I went to the fall games and watched, but I knew they were in great hands. And and they are rock stars themselves and they are really mature and understand what they need to get done. So was not a problem. That's nice to have so an alum like that. Or yeah, yeah. Could, could, you know, hey, can you come around here once in a while? That's pretty good uh, yeah. company to have. What, what do you expect from the rest of the pitching staff? Danielle gets so much of the attention, but she's not the only arm. And I know it's not, you don't want to just depend on her because you need others to step up. And you mentioned Newport. She was a big part of your staff. And, and you know, obviously you're glad to have her now on the, on the coaching staff, but you're obviously going to miss her as a player. We'll talk about her, her bat, but first her arm, you don't have her arm. So just talk about the rest of the staff. Yeah, she was always great with us with just anything that we needed. Sometimes she started, sometimes, most of the time she was coming in relief. So we're really looking for someone to kind of fill that role of the little every anything and everything. But Lauren Boyd, who's coming back as a sophomore, had a really good freshman start. Um, kind of a typical freshman year where she had some ups and downs. And she came out uh, with a little bit of an injury at the end with her foot. So she was on a little bit of a pitch count towards the end of the season. But was able to pitch in the NCAA tournament, started that second game against Kentucky. And I thought I was very impressed with her poise at that level. And uh, I think that was going to springboard her into her sophomore season. I think she's grown a lot, really, really mature, understanding how to pitch, uh, not throw, which is re it's really fun. Her team loves playing behind her. So I'm really excited to see her kind of be a duo. And then we have Sydney Supley, that's a junior now and has a lot of experience as a lefty like a lefty specialist um, she's been a lot of um, in relief a lot so I'm looking for her to start a little bit more as well and then we've got um, two other righties uh, Lauren Dvorak who's a senior who's worked really hard this fall hasn't had a lot of innings and um, I, I'm looking forward to getting her out there and then our freshman, like I said, righty as well, who the ball just kind of gets on you with her so she throws mid 60s she's got a lot of length and Good, good deception. So I'm excited to see where she can fill in some gaps too. I'm also been fascinated. I've always, you know, with your staff, because some of them hit, you play two way mm -hmm. players. Just take me through that process. Is that something that you all look at when you recruit? Do you want two way players? How much, you know, do you know, you obviously played with one of the greatest two ways in, in Kalani, uh, who did and excelled at both. How does that process go? Because obviously you have time with them in the in the bullpen, but then they also have to have their hitting as well. So how does that work and how does that balance and how is that beneficial? Yeah, it's been a huge part of our system and our program. And I think our team really enjoys playing behind pitchers that hit and, and the pitchers being able to win their own game is always fun. I think we had a three game series or a four game series last year where um, our pitchers had like 28 RBIs or something crazy. It was it was so fun. So um, we really do look for that, but it's not, it's, it just depends on the fit of the player and the pitcher. It doesn't have to be, but like, like right this season, I think we're going to have four out of five that, that we'll see in that bat and two out of those that will play another position if, if so. So, um, it's really fun. I think they really understand the game. It keeps the pitching bit light sometimes where, you know, it can be or just dwelling on pitching or like, okay, just go get some swings in, take a break and then come back to the bullpen. But I do kind of hog them from Carol a little bit, especially during season. So they're really good about getting their work in on their own. I mean, I did see Kehlani do it in college and it takes a lot of hard work to be on both sides of the ball at that elite level. And I'm really proud that they, they step up and they, they stay extra and they get their swings in after practice when when maybe it was more of a pitching day for them scheduled for us. So they, they make it work and they're able to uh, contribute both. So we like that. With your pitching staff, do you like having set roles? Do you just kind of want to keep it open? And how much do you talk to them about, hey, 
your number could get called at any moment. You knew that. Obviously, the more the most famous story is how you got the ball in game two, and a lot of people didn't expect it. They just assumed Kalani would get it, but you got the ball because of the trust they had in you uh, and things like that. How much of that do you relay that to your uh, staff? Yeah, I think we talk about roles, but no one's ever really set in it. You know, it's, um, we, we I want to talk to them about roles because I need to understand what that means for them that day you know so we'll go into a double header you know some of these pre-game preseason tournaments where we have these gauntlet double headers and we'll say okay we know who's starting both games well we think some days it's going to be like we're going to start game one with this person second person's in relief you're a late close maybe and then we kind of go one game at a time and other days we are set with okay we know who's starting both games you know who's relief both games and they, but they know they need to be ready for anything. And uh, we communicate that, like I said, it's with the four game series, it was interesting because we didn't really have like a set rotation that Saturday. We, we, we mixed it up a lot with different starters, different people, different orders, different relieving. Um, and I think that, that that's good for them. I think that it's good for them to be ready for anything and they rise to that. Offensively, you return a lot of bats. Skyler Schellmeyer was a first teamer, hit 360 there for your team. Uh, Jordan Rudd uh, also returns there as well as your team, 329 on the team. Rachel Lewis, 336. You do lose Newport, who hit 10 homers. He's on your coaching staff. But overall, just talk about, you know, Skyler and Jordan and Rachel, what they bring is probably the leaders on the offensive of end. Yeah, it's they're veteran. Uh, I think what's great about it is we face them all time in practice and we're, we're up on January right now. January always gets a little long because we're facing these good hitters all the time, but they're giving us great feedback. I think they've really grown up in the fact that they're learning how to really um, understand their own game plans at the plate and different pitchers and different style of pitchers. And, you know, you always want your pitchers to make your hitters better and vice versa. So I think with this group, we're really doing that. And I saw that kind of being away this fall and then coming back and I, I came into some practices that we did live at bats and I was really impressed with those veteran hitters and and how hard they've worked at that specifically so it's just going to make our pitchers even better and less predictable more deceptive because they're telling us things that they're seeing or looking for every day you have four new faces uh how do you blend in the new faces with such a veteran group obviously you depend on your leaders for that uh, but how do the new faces kind of contribute to the team there at such a veteran ball club? Yeah, I've been also really impressed. I would say definitely Rachel Lewis and Skylar Shellmeyer are go-to leaders uh, vocally and, and also just with their presence, uh, like their steadiness. And I think that they've really done a good job of bringing those freshmen in. We have a couple really talented freshman infielders that I think that will contribute and it's fun to see them being able to push the veterans. And I think the veterans really want that. So I'm excited that that's just going to keep us more competitive and, and with some depth, you know, with COVID, who knows injuries, you don't, you don't really know what's going to happen. So I think everybody pushing each other, these freshmen are, you know, they're right on board. I think going through the fall, it always is, is a little bit of a, the game speeds up on the freshmen a little bit, but they're right on track where they need to be. So I'm excited to see them come spring. This team has been battle tested. Uh, you know, go back to last year, you were a four seed in Lexington, which was, uh, you know, I've talked to all the coaches in that region. That was like the group of death. They call that in World Cup soccer. You got just four strong teams. You had that <laughs> last year. Where you get Kentucky, Notre Dame, and Miami of Ohio. I mean, that was as strong of a league. Two year, you know, 19, you're your host. Battle really good Louisville team, and then you run, you know, you go to Norman, some program over there. You might be from in the supers there. But their team is battle tested. How much is that talked about, discussed as far as, you know, I don't know if it's from an unfinished business or that experience now going over to 2022? Yeah, I think that, you, you know, it's talked about when it's appropriate, but at the same time, it's just that they take everything in stride you know th this group is really mature and i i think that they are just so ready to get outside of our conference and go and play those teams before postseason um i think you know that obviously is a little weird just getting to postseason we're like all right let's finally play someone in the sec <laughs> we're excited. you know normally it's it's from sh from the shoot so um yeah it, it was nice to go out there and see where we stacked up because you're just kind of watching um from 
you know, on TV, these other games and, and you're like, well, we didn't really get to play them in preseason or anyone that has played them last year. So we didn't really know going into the regional, how we were going to be. We, we thought it was probably about what we thought. Um, but yeah, that regional was tough. It was fun. Um, it was fun to watch the other teams play as we scouted as well. It was, it was just a gauntlet, like you said, but yeah, we're, we're ready. They're excited. And I think they are really mature and battle tested that, you know, that 2019 regional, we got ourselves our own loser bracket as the hosts and they've come out of that. So I think that all these experiences for the senior group are really going to pay off this season. And how it was big, you know, it's always your expectations. I know in, to make the tournament, but I've talked to coaches that told me, you know, that was kind of important to make the tournament just because we didn't have one in 2020. So it felt good to be, you know, have that experience again, because a lot of players didn't experience that. Uh, did you feel that way too, that, Hey, it was huge to get into the tournament, to remind yourself how it, what it feels like, especially since you only played conference and they feel that that's going to help uh, uh, this upcoming year and beyond. Yeah, and I, I think an, another point to add to that is we didn't have a Big Ten tournament, which we normally do, because normally the Big Ten tournament prepares you for that tournament style going into the regional. And so for our sophomores, our sophomore group, they never even experienced that. As So we had two classes going into the regional for the first time in that in that type of format. So I am very fortunate for that experience for that group. That's that that isn't that young, but still feels postseason and I'm you know even Alan Jordan and these other seniors they've only had two postseasons so you know putting that into perspective is uh is really interesting going forward as a, as we looked back onto the 21 season that's an interesting point about the Big Ten tournament I forgot about that you're right because you didn't have that tournament you have it back is that some of the things that you all maybe took for granted that you don't anymore because I've talked to a lot of coaches on the west coast and they have admitted to me the one thing they learned from last year among many things is they kind of took for granted those tournaments in the West Coast, Mary Nutter and Judy Garman and all that because of the experience they would get in playing in those tournaments. They didn't have that ability uh, and they felt that that hurt their team and they now they don't take those tournaments for granted. Not that they did it before, but they now appreciate it more. Is that how you all feel in the league that, you know, it's just the things, the little things like playing non-conference midweeks and Big Ten tournaments that you have a bigger, greater appreciation for? I would say the midweeks were something that I took for granted prior because sometimes it can feel so crammed in. Um, you're getting ready to play Minnesota on the weekend and then you're turning around and playing DePaul on Tuesday and you're like, okay, like I got to get, you know, we got to rest, but also prepare for both. And, um, but, you know, it was really nice to break things up. So I think for, you know, if you come off of a rough loss on a Sunday in a big 10, in a big 10 game, and then you, get out to somebody non-conference on the week it's kind of nice to not practice every single day in between and just get out there and play so I do think that was the one thing that I just myself as a coach I was like you know it's just nice to get out there and get some different hitters um in between those series at times so I am looking forward to those midweeks I think we've got Notre Dame Loyola um and DePaul like we usually do well that's the thing in your region you've got quality games you could schedule midweek so you, yeah. I mean, that that's good competition to get you tested for conference only and also for the resume. Yeah, absolutely. We're really fortunate in our area that, you know, we can drive it's down to Lincoln Park and play to Paul in a midweek and they're always strong program and, and same with the other Chicago area teams. So um, always nice for us. We're speaking with Michelle Gascoigne, Northwestern assistant coach here on In the Circle. I want to ask you of some off, uh, uh, off the field storylines from that came a bit. The Women's College World Series was a big, big success, obviously a lot more popular, but also a lot of talking points. They've changed the schedule after what happened in 2021 with the late games and the weather delays and things like that. They've uh, changed the schedule. You played in it. You're also a coach. I'm fascinated your perspective from a player standpoint and a coaching standpoint of the changes of the schedule for the women's college world series. I'm mean, do you like it? Yeah, I think it's a hundred percent positive. You know, I think it's about time, you know, going into Oklahoma city, there's going to be some type of weather, you know, if there's not, it's uh, it's very it's slim. So I think that just building that in just gives the flexibility to everyone that's there to get, the best product and to get the best opportunity for the student athletes. You know, I think 
you know, going back to my experience as an athlete in 2012 and really forcing that that Alabama game and you know it is what it is both teams had the same opportunity so you know I'm not going to say it, it was unfair but at the same time I think as a coach now looking at it for my athletes I wouldn't want to put my athletes in that situation playing that late with that soggy field and you know you want a championship to feel like a championship on all levels so I think that this gives the opportunity for athletes to a little bit recover you want to beat someone when they're at their best when you want to win it all so I I think it's really positive yeah the rain there I mean game three there and I've talked to some coaches they told me the big thing is and you probably you you went through this twice is you're playing to get to that championship series but you don't have a day off in between. You're like, you kind of run into it. You have to do all these media obligations with things like that, where now you do have that little bit of a buffer zone. How big was that, you know, from a mental standpoint now where these play now they'll have a break just getting to the World Series because getting to the ch- championship series is just as tough as getting to the World Series. Yeah, it's such a whirlwind when you're in it. It's just like time stands still on everything else and you're just fighting to survive. Like you're getting back to the hotel so late and by the time, you know, for pitchers and catchers that are doing recovery or anybody that else that needs that, um, sometimes it's two, three in the morning by the time you eat, shower, recover, and and then your brain is just on from the whole day and all of it. So it's really hard to rest and get that recovery in, let alone the coaches doing the scouting and watching video and preparing to prepare your team. So like I said, I think our game has evolved with all that we have with data and analytics and things and it just takes time to really through those things and to also for our athletes we're asking so much of them to recover um, so quickly in that heat or whatever it is so like I said I think that this extra day built in it's gonna just be a better series I think that we're gonna see that maybe some more three game series or you know I think we've seen a lot of them go three games but I think it'll be really interesting to see how it pans out. And I think it'll be really good for the teams to, to get that extra day. Do you remember what was the latest you ever got back to the hotel after a game from the, I mean, cause I've heard well, some stuff. I mean, some people got back like two, three in the morning. Like well, how late could it get? The first game of the championship series, my senior year against Tennessee, it was 12 innings, I think. So yeah. I, I don't know the time, but I know it was, it was really late into the morning and, and we're in our hotel room just, like trying to calm down. I think our coaches always did a good job of that, of like, okay, like turn it off. Like Kilani and I are watching sports center at like three in the morning in our hotel room, <laughs> watching the replays of our game, but it, cause it was so exciting. But then we're like, okay, we gotta, we gotta sleep, you know, knowing the next day could mean so much. So it's definitely a challenge. And, and um, I think that just, it, it, like I said, you're just kind of in a whirlwind the whole time. So an extra day can really give you a lot. Well, that's a great point uh, that I, I didn't even, I just didn't realize. So you just brought it up is, you know, you're playing in these long games or late night games. You can't just shut it down right away. Right. There's that exuberance. There's that, you know, energy just from playing a game that high, if you will. I mean, media people, I've been to press boxes. I have a hard time just going to sleep right away after covering a game. I can't even imagine from a student athlete standpoint. Yeah, there's definitely a come down period because after you've got the fans, you've got autographs, you've got press conference, all those things. And, you know, your coaches are doing their best to kind of corral and get you moving in the right direction towards rest and recovery. But there's just a lot of outside things control and um, but that are exciting that you don't want to skip. You know, you you only get so many times that someone wants your autograph. So um, I think that's it's exciting, but it does it does go late into the night in those in those times. They're going to have uh, instant replay for postseason, uh, and it's now optional for all conferences and things like that. What's your reaction from a player again, player standpoint, having replay from a coach's standpoint? Yeah, when I, when I was a player, I don't think I thought like much about it because it wasn't really around yet. But as a coach, I, I'm excited to see it. I think I've seen it. Um, in, in baseball watching and how quick they're able to get it done and, and doesn't disrupt a lot. And, you know, when you're watching some of these games on TV, you, it's always an interesting perspective than when you're in it because you're a little bit less biased of what's going on. But you can really see how some of these things can change the game so, so quickly. So I'm excited for them to be able to really just take a look and get things right because, you know, sometimes it's your season on and, and it's just one miss, miss, mishap. But I also think that umpires are 
good at their jobs in general. Like if you look in MLB, they, they get it right most of the time. So I think hopefully we'll see that, but if not, it'll maybe make us have to make some adjustments on that end as well. Where are we with that with the Big Ten? Do you see it happening in the Big Ten? Can it happen? I know facilities play a role in that. Yeah. Uh, so it's up to the institutions in some cases. Where Where is it from a Big Ten standpoint? I, I think we're ready to go with it. I think it's like up to the institution, but I'm pretty sure that we're all on board and we're, we're going to be doing it for our conference um, each game. So I um, I would normally know more about that, but I missed out on convention this year <laughs> due to my new board. So <laughs> you, you have a good reason, although, man, you must have part of you is like, really, this is the year you all decided to go to have it in Vegas. Like you couldn't yeah. have picked a different location. This was the year, but you, know, you had good reasons. Yes. Uh, the big other topic from the World Series, once Oklahoma won, is where does this team stack up all time? They asked, they bombarded Coach Gasso with those questions. She dodged them, as you would expect. I've been a defender of your team. You know this. I've talked to you. I've talked to Kalani. Me and Amanda Scott, we both, we've said that the 13 team is the best team ever. Some people are trying to make the case for the 21 team. I'm not going to ask you to, like, you know, pick, you know, sides. I know where you stand on that, but just kind of. You saw that unfolding. What what goes through your mind? You're obviously an alum there, so you're you know you're hoping they do well. But I'm sure when those topics came up, it's like, hey, 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 what about our? Don't forget our team here. Yeah, no, it's always fun. I, I think it's fun that, they're, you know, it's we're able to compare because it means it's they're continuing to do well and grow. But um, yeah, obviously, I'm going to be on our side, and I. I'm going to just say that I would not want to face that lineup as a pitcher though. So, <laughs> um, so uh, that, I mean, I think the offense was outstanding and, and just scary, like one through nine, but um, you know, I think Kalani and I could take them on. So we'll see. <laughs> so I'm going to pitch you. Jessica Schultz told me she tried to remind coach Gasso. Hey, Hey, don't forget about our team there. You know, yeah, like yeah. Were there. Is, yeah, there, is there any of that good. going on? Yeah, no, it, we, it was all fun. fun. We're, we were really like, I mean, watching like the young so Nicole Mays from where like from my area I know her as a family friend and so it was kind of fun to watch her as a freshman just get out there and go for it and watching G really step up and late so I think Kilani and I always talking about the pitchers and how they're doing and you know obviously critiquing some things but at the end of the day, we're just really happy for them and and rooting them on they're going to get a new stadium. Uh, they're, they're the process they're building the, the new stadium there I know I've talked to coach Gasso about that talk about that the growth, not only for them, but just facilities in general. You travel all over the place. Facilities now, upgrades everywhere are being built in softball, more attendance than ever before. Uh, you know, and she mentioned a lot of the players. She mentioned you, Coach Gasso, but making it happen by building the blocks, if you will. That has to make you proud that that's going on in Oklahoma and, and part of it, uh, part of the continuation of the growth of the sport. Yeah, I definitely am proud of that. And I'm really proud of everyone that's been a part of getting that off the ground because, um, it, you know, it feels like it's a long time coming, but these things are really hard to get done. So I know that with coach and all her staff, they were relentless in it because it's it's what the athletes deserve. And and I think that's what our sport deserves. And um, the fans, oh my goodness. I mean, we had to go there for the Super Regional 19 and and it, the lines out around the corner, there's people in the outfield, not even in the stadium. And you know, they just have outgrown it, which is a great thing. That's what you want to do. And um, it'll be fun to see the fans really get to, you know, get total control of like concessions and seats and bathroom lines be regular and things like that. Cause it was bursting at the seams for a while. And, and I'm really excited because they're still going to fill it up, but it's going to be a lot, a lot better of experience for everybody. What was it like to be a visitor there? Like, is that was weird? Like, I talked to Samantha Ricketts about it when she went as an assistant. She said at first it was a little awkward because you're in a different dugout. You're like, wait, wait a minute. Oh, that's right. Like, because yeah. there's a lot of memories that popped into your head. Totally. Weirdly enough, we, in 2019, we went there for a preseason tournament. Coach convinced us to go. And <laughs> so I had already gotten that out of the system, which was good. So when the NCAA sent it there, obviously a lot more on the line. Um wouldn't want to do it again with that on the line but at the same time um you know you just go and you compete with your team and it's about them and uh you know obviously it's a little it's a little weird and um you're you know you're just trying to stay moment and and go like you would as an athlete <laughs> yeah i mean it's, it's so unique but you're so beloved there too so it's like it, it's it's got to be such a fascinating deal we see this now in sports a lot obviously we saw this with tom brady going back to foxborough but, you know, playing, but you're coaching 
against somebody that helped you get into coaching. Obviously, Coach Gasso, I mean, her and Coach Drohan, two important figures in the sport and two people that have obviously influenced your coaching. Yeah, I mean, and, and Coach is such a pro at it. She's had, she's had to coach against her alums, and I know she gets amped up when it happens. So you're like, okay, she gets the team riled up, and and they really want to play because she's like, don't let, don't let them beat us. So if you know <laughs> that, you, I've been on the other end of that conversation. So I know she amps it up when she's facing an alum as a coach, but, but she's so um, helpful in our coaching careers with all of us that have um, gone into it and and just a great sounding board and someone that, you know, we can always go to for different questions and things. So um, it's, she, it's just, it's fun. It's fun to see her on the other side because I think she's really proud and you know that she's so competitive, but um, you wouldn't want it any other way. Um, so, you know, the coolest thing I think about that regional was that both Sharon Drysdale and Marita Hines were there who are both the namesakes wow. of, the current field, our field, with Sharon Drysdale being our previous head coach before Kate, and uh, and Marita Hines at Norman. So that was really cool to see that coaching coaching happen and be be in support there too. That's unbelievable. I hope somebody yeah. took photos. Somebody yeah, please tell me. There were, yeah, okay. they were. I think they got a shout out on TV or something, which they well deserved. Obviously, they've done a lot for the sport. That's incredible. Do you kind of pinch yourself sometimes? I mean, you played for Coach Cassie. You're coaching for the draw hands. I mean, these are Hall of Fame big figures. Like, how are they different? How are they alike? What's it like? I mean, and you, I mean, it's got to be amazing for you. Not many p coaches could say they go from Coach Cassie to a Coach Drohan types. Yeah, no, I'm, I mean, I'm obviously very fortunate. And I think that there's just a lot of respect between the two programs. So obviously, now with the connection, me kind of bridging that, but. Um, I think that at the end of the day, they, there's obviously compare, you can compare different coaches for different reasons, but they're just professionals and they are both then competitors, you know, and they get their team to compete in, in their own styles. So, um, really fortunate to be a part of both programs. Obviously a couple more things, uh, you had a great pro career, won a, a NPF championship with the bandits. So Rosemont, you know, very well inside out. They, that's where now the home of been Athletes Unlimited the previous two, two seasons. I'm curious your thoughts on Athletes Unlimited. Uh, as somebody who had a pro career, obviously no more NPF. There's going to be starting up a new league, a pro league perhaps in 2022 with your teammate Lauren Chamberlain as the commissioner. What's your thoughts on the overall landscape of the pro game? Yeah, um, I'm glad that I live in Chicago. So I have ProSoft always <laughs> at my fingertips a lot and able to kind of go and be around. I was able to help out with the athletes unlimited open tryout last year and fun to see see that kind of getting off the ground obviously really sad that there are no longer chicago bandits a lot of my best friends great memories two championships um really really great time that i was in the league and really fortunate for but you know for progress i think sometimes things have to move you have to kind of move forward and change it up and i think with covid and the olympics it kind of was this natural break in things and it is what it is, but I think the Athletes Unlimited is really catching on. I just saw that they're expanding to do uh, something on the front end of the summer yeah. before they get to Rosemont. So I'm excited to see where that's going to be to open up where, you know, more fans can watch soft. Um, you know, I think the Athletes Unlimited thing is really cool. I kind of wish I could play in it, <laughs> um, you know, if the timing were beforehand, just because you're not traveling as much. I think that was the hard part for um, us coaches that were still playing at the time was trying to recruit in the summer and travel, but them all being in Rosemont the whole time is really an interesting factor for just kind of being able to make it work um, financially and for people that are kind of doing both. Um, and then hopefully Lauren's league <laughs> gets off the ground in Oklahoma city and know that she's going to do her absolute best and, and there's a lot of people in her corner. So, you know, the more opportunity, the better we have a huge gap the Olympics for softball so it's time to get things going and and see what we can do on the pro side Lauren's been kind of taking the mantle as one of the spokespeople of the sport uh and has been involved in all different levels did you see that from her when you played with her? did you see this coming from her was this something you always kind of like I could see her being involved in the game in different areas beyond playing or this this kind of what have you what's been your thoughts seeing her and kind of grow into this role that she has you know, I, I wouldn't say immediately I would see her doing this, but she's always had so much charisma and she's just a natural, like, 
leader with energy and positivity. But I think with her kind of going through some tough injuries with her playing career, it led her into this path of giving back to the game in another way because um, that's the way that she's physically able to. So I think that I always picture her playing as long as she possibly could, and she did, and she did really well with what she could. And um, now I'm just really proud that she's able to do this on this end of things and just give back into all facets and and hopefully it just keeps growing because I think she's a great role model for us. I, I spoke to uh, Samantha Ricketts talking about Kalani, obviously being on the Olympic team, and now she's doing, you know, kind of her own lessons. And she said, you know, some people are neat, trying to like kind of tug at her. And it's like, you know, get into this coaching thing already. You know, like, what are you doing? Are you one of those people? Are you are you kind of telling Kalani, hey, you know, it's not so bad here? Or does that ever come up? Um, I'm not. I, I think that she can do what she wants. <laughs> um, I, I think she understands what it is. Obviously, her sister does it. And she's um, a volunteer at o o Oklahoma. Uh, and so she understands that side of it. I think she she likes it, but I think she also likes the the lessons and she has a lot of flexibility with that and she does a good job with the young pitchers and uh, so we talk more about the specific pitching stuff, not no, not not more so the college game at this point. That makes sense. Pitchers yeah. great yeah, you know, pitchers talk pitching. I that that, that yeah. makes a ton of sense. <laughs> Last thing now, as you get into January and you get before you know it, the season you're going to open up in in Florida, the great inaugural tournament there. What are going to be some of the keys for your team internally to accomplish your internal goals? What are some of the things you need you want to see? Great question. I I, I think leadership of our seniors, you know, steadiness. Um, I, I think obviously every coach wants their team to be consistent, but if we can stay steady and consistent, both on the field, off the field, I think that we're going to be. In us with that schedule so just taking each game one at a time well we're looking forward to seeing your team we're looking forward to seeing them in florida to start the season and seeing the the non-conference and then get into conference play uh, but in the meantime uh it's great to talk to you again uh congrats again on being a mom and uh and balancing that out with coaching uh and certainly we, we look forward to seeing the, the little one and as well as seeing obviously your team play as well as the coach strohans but uh thanks for taking the time uh to talking to us yeah, thanks, Eric. We're excited for uh, 2022, so bring it on. <laughs>